So a very good morning to all my seniors, colleagues, and juniors. Uh, today we'll be discussing about a case of fever in patient who has undergone mitral wall replacement. So let's see our patient. So our patient is a 66 year old Indian female. She had undergone mitral wall replacement six years back. She was doing well post surgery, uh, well anticoagulated, and her time in therapeutic range was more than 70%. She presented to us with low grade fever, uh, which was present for 10 days. Outside, a cardio physician saw some doubtful small structure which was attached to the leaflet of mitral wall process. What is it? What is our patient suffering from? What is the cause of pyrexia in this patient? And for that matter, any patient who presents with pyrexia of a longer duration. The most common causes in immunocompetent individuals include infective endocarditis, discitis, osteomyelitis, occult abscesses, and infection of any implanted device. Our patient has a clue in the form of a doubtful structure which is attached on the leaflet of her mitral wall processes on duty echo. So is it prosthetic valve infection? Well, it would be too early to say so. Yes, the most common presenting symptom in patients with prosthetic valve endocarditis is fever. You should always keep a high index of suspicion in patients who have undergone mitral or aortic valve replacement because prosthetic, the symptoms of prosthetic valve endocarditis include fever and other constellation symptoms like fatigue, poor appetite, and weakness. And these symptoms are also present during other infection. Late onset prosthetic wall endocarditis can be defined as endocarditis occurring more than one year following wall replacement surgery. All the staff aureus and cons remain important causes. The microbiology of these late onset infections resemble more closely that of native wall endocarditis. So is our diagnosis clear? Wait a minute. The most commonly encountered and frustrating clinical situation is the administration of empirical antibiotics without first obtaining blood cultures when patients with prosthetic hal fall present to clinicians in outpatient or emergency with fever. So yes, there is a doubt that our patient too have, must have received some sort of antibiotic before she presented to us. But yes, we have echo and specially T to our rescue. Trans-esophageal echo, better known as TEE, enables better visualization of cardiac structures, especially the apical side of mitral wall processes compared to the trans-thoracic echo. T is especially useful in assessing the perivalvular extension of the infection and detection of vegetation on prosthetic heart wall and cardiovascular implantable electronic devices. Trans-esophageal echo has better diagnostic yield not only for native wall endocarditis, but also for prosthetic mitral wall endocarditis prosthetic mitral wall abscesses and perivalvular mitral regurgitation due to the infection of the mitral wall processes. Based on these data, T has now become the imaging test of choice in all the patients who are suspected to have endogaritis involving the prosthetic heart wall. So what is the role of T in our patient? How does T help the diagnosis in our patient? We'll just go through the Duke criteria. The Duke criteria has been set uh, for diagnosing patients who have endovirus involving not only the native ball, but also the prosthetic ball. It has two major criteria in the terms in the form of typical blood culture and imaging evidence of valve involvement by infection and minor criteria, which include a predisposing heart condition, fever, vascular phenomena, immunologic phenomena, and atypical culture or serology. Thanks to T, if we don't do T in our patient, it would be very clear what that small structure attached to mitral wall processes would be, which would mostly would be a vegetation as against thrombus or panis, considering the history she has. So ultimately, we would be reaching to our diagnosis using the T and the Duke criteria. So our patient would have either two major in the form of an imaging evidence of some sort of infection attached to a mitral wall leaflet and a typical blood culture. If the patient would have been given antibiotics outside, we would have either one major and three minor criteria, major in the form of imaging evidence and minor in the form of, minor in the form of fever, a predisposing heart condition, and atypical serological culture, thus confirming the diagnosis of our patient to be having prosthetic valve endocarditis, and ultimately we can start the treatment. Just to summarize, trans esophageal echo is necessary in all cases suspected to have prosthetic valve endocarditis for not only diagnosing, 
but for valvular hemodynamic assessment and eventual detection of vegetations attached to the valve, abscesses, or fistula. It is useful in estimating the mobility of the leaflet and the stability of the valvular ring. Detection of vegetations may be difficult due to artifacts from the valves while doing transthoracic echo, and hence transthoracic echo lost its sheen. But the sensitivity of transesophageal echo or T in the detection of prophetic or endocarditis is as high as 82 to 96%. At the same time, the negative predictive value of transesophageal echo in patients with suspected prophetic valve endocarditis ranges from 86 to 94%. And hence, T in not only in our patient, but in any patient whom all my colleagues or juniors face, having prophetic fall along with fever, after having excluded other common causes of fever, would be really helpful in diagnosing patients with prophetic fall endocarditis. Thank you all for your patient hearing. Thank you so much.